The following is a CUNY TV special presentation. It is now my honor to introduce our uh, guests this morning. We are pleased to have with us New York City Comptroller John C. Liu. As the 43rd Comptroller, you can give him applause too. Everybody's. John is responsible for ensuring the city's financial health. Uh, Comptroller Lou audits, and finan uh, audits the finances and performances of city agencies, reviews city's contracts, reports on the state of the city budget and economy, markets municipal bonds, and serves as custodian and trustee of the five New York City pension funds. Comptroller Lou has worked with the city's Office of Management and Budget to refinance high interest, rate, uh, high interest bonds saving taxpayers close to $2 billion in debt service since 2010. As the financial steward of the city's pension system, Comptroller Liu has modernized the pension's management in order to ensure the best in class among peer institutional investors worldwide. The five city pensions together have grown 40% since his tenure. As an activist investor, Comptroller Liu committed to investing $1 billion in the city's teachers from the city's teachers' retirement system in a partnership with the Clinton Global Initiative uh, to restore infrastructure damaged by Superstorm Sandy. Welcome to Ab Abney, John, and we look forward to hearing your views uh, and discuss your vision for improving New York City's long-term economic prospects through strate strategic investments in education, housing, and infrastructure. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome New York City Comptroller John Liu. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with all of you here, and I want to thank the Association for Better New York for having me. I want to ask you to keep the coffee flowing because, I, I, look, I'm the controller. I've got a lot of numbers to throw at you this morning, and we want to keep everybody alert and awake. Uh, and looking around this room, I do see that we have some of the best and brightest here in New York City. And I know that we all, despite some differences perhaps, want to, see, to, want to make New York an even better place and our future brighter. That's why I want to talk with you this morning about the New York City dream, something that has existed for at least 100 years, but lately has, been, has become tarnished, if not forgotten, the New York City dream. Ask anyone in this room or anyone on the street outside, and they'll tell you what it is. We all remember it. We learned about it in elementary school with nothing when we could come to New York with nothing but the clothes on our back. And with the help of a great public school education, we could start at the bottom and work our way to the top and become whatever you want it to be. The New York City dream attracted people from all over the world, across the country, New York was considered the city in the Golden of Medina, which in uh, my native land of Taiwan, it's Yiddish for the city in a country that with streets paved with gold. And indeed, my family immigrated here in 1972 when I was five years old. And uh, I didn't even speak a word of English at the time. My family, my parents were filled with hope that here in New York City, a family named Lou could aspire to become something like a family named Kennedy. For decades, for four decades after my family arrived in the Big Apple, New York City continues to attract immigrants. In fact, immigration remains a primary driver of our economic growth. Nearly 40% of the city's current population is foreign born, and so is half our workforce. Immigrants represent 90% of New York City's taxi and limousine drivers, 75% of home health aides, and 65% of those in food service. But it doesn't stop there. Immigrants are well represented throughout our economy, and many arrive with impressive academic credentials. New Yorkers intuitively understand that the time for immigration reform is now. Hopefully, folks in Washington will finally recognize that immigration is not a burden, but a boon to our domestic and local economies. New Yorkers today are faced with a challenging reality. 
four out of five New York City public school students do not graduate from college. Nearly half of New Yorkers have rents that are unaffordable. And minimum wage jobs don't pay enough to support a single person, let alone adults with kids to feed. How do we keep the dream alive for New Yorkers? Whether their families came here in the great migration from the deep south, or through Ellis Island, or just last year through JFK Airport. I firmly believe that government can play a vital role, a vital and positive role, in restoring the New York City dream. Ultimately, and unfortunately, there are some vagaries in New York City government that contribute to some growing cynicism that folks have about the political process. These problems undermine the ability of more people to achieve the, America, the New York City dream. And I want to take some time to highlight one of them. It's something that we have all gotten used to, something we should all work together, though, to end. And this, my friends, is what's commonly referred to as the budget dance. As you know, every year, the mayor of the city of New York and the council of the city of New York engage in this budget dance. It's a dance we know well, and I'm certainly very familiar with it. After spending 10 years in government, eight years in the city council, and a little more than three years now as comptroller, it's a dance that uh, even my wife Jenny acknowledges. She thinks that I have two left feet, but she knows that I know the budget dance. This dance begins with the mayor unveiling his proposed budget. He says that there's just not enough money to go around that important city services like senior centers, libraries, fire companies, and after-school programs must be cut, cha-cha-cha. And then it continues with the foxtrot, with the speaker and council members quickly denouncing these cuts. A little salsa gets thrown in when advocates from across the city converge on the steps of City Hall and protests and organize letter-writing campaigns to demand that these vital services get restored. And then somehow, magically, after weeks of claiming that a deal was nearly impossible, the council speaker and the mayor waltz in and announce that there's a compromise to restore the cuts. The budget dance doesn't include a final dip, but there is the unofficial handshake and the photo op in the city hall rotunda. Now, I know folks in this room are well aware of the budget dance, and some of you might wonder, ah, what's wrong with a little political theater? The problem with the budget dance, though, is that I, I believe that it must be ended because it serves as a blinder, a blinder that focuses the public attention on less than $400 million in a budget that totals $70 billion. That means that a little more than one half of 1% of our budget gets debated, while the rest is largely taken for granted. Year after year, minor tweaks are made to the budget when what's really called for is a wholesale review of the city's resources and needs. Now, the budget revenues, some of the budget experts among you might point out that a significant portion of the New York City's budget is comprised of what are called non-controllable items including things like Medicaid, pension obligations, and debt service. I certainly agree. In fact, depending on how you classify certain expenses, the non-controllable budget, part of the budget, accounts for some $38 billion. And while there may be some ways to impact this part of the budget, it's largely fixed. What I'm most concerned about is the controllable part of the, the budget which currently accounts for $32 billion. We, ha we as a city have a much larger degree of discretion over how this part of the budget is spent. Uh, over time, I've come to believe that the budget dance, which focuses on that small sliver of the discretionary budget, has the effect of distracting New Yorkers from taking a closer look at how the city spends that $32 billion discretionary budget. So, I can, so how can we move away from the budget dance, which I believe undermines the New York City dream, and move toward a more sensi sensible budgetary process that produces better results? As controller, 
with the help of my outstanding staff, I review the city budget annually. And historically, our review process has centered around the identification of budgetary risks. For example, we have an economic team that forecasts tax revenues. Our results are then compared to the city's revenue estimates, and our differences are then reported on any variances, regardless of the direction. We do similar work on the expense and capital budgets, and we will continue to carry out our charter mandate or responsibilities in this area when the mayor unveils his fiscal year 2014 executive budget in just a few weeks' time. However, after growing increasingly frustrated with the budget dance, I asked my budget staff to comb through the entire budget with a different mindset, a laser-like focus on the $32 billion of discretionary funds. And I told them that there were no sacred cows, challenging them to identify new resources that could be used to make new investments for the people of New York City. Today, I'd like to share with you a new proposal that is an outgrowth of the, the, that work. It's a proposal created in the public spirit of the people, by the people, and for the people. We call it the people's budget. The people's budget is an effort to translate our values and priorities into dollars and cents, a way to keep the dream alive and deliver on the promise of what New York City can and should be. Unlike the budget dance, which focuses on a tiny portion of the, of the budget and takes the rest of it for granted, the people's budget puts it all on the table. It reimagines our New York City budget in a whole new way. And the totality of this is certainly available on my website. Uh, we're going to give copies of this immediately after the speech. Uh, it also gives us an op opportunity to have a fresh start in the city of New York with regard to how we spend our limited resources. So uh, let's start with public education. I think uh, probably a lot of you went to school here in New York City. I, I certainly did, from kindergarten all the way through high school at Bronx Science. I'm sure there are some Stuyvesant folks in this room. That clap was for Bronx Science, by the way. The number one priority of the people's budget is to make New York City public schools great again so that the next generation and generations to come can have what we had. How, how will we know when we achieve that goal? When everyone in this room is willing, no, eager, to send their kids to New York City public schools. I just dropped Joey off at school this morning like I always do. He's in the seventh grade and I think the schools are doing a good job with him because his critical thinking is top notched. Well, look, I'm talking about great schools here in New York City, and not just Bronx Science and Stuyvesant and Hunter High School or the likes, but I'm talking about every New York City public school. Adequately funding every New York City school will produce the best return on investments we can possibly hope for. Uh, but the peace, people's budget has other priorities as well. We need to do a better job of creating affordable housing, of ensuring public safety, and of providing social services to our growing senior population. We need to provide economic security to the middle class through tax relief and common sense workplace priorities. Now, some of you might be shaking your heads thinking, oh, there goes that bleeding heart John Liu again. How's he gonna pay for all this, this uh, fantasy here? Well, let's discuss it. Budgets need to be balanced, so imagine a huge scale with pans for carrying weight on either side. The left side will provide our budget with new resources. The right side identifies our investments. On the left side, we have revenue growth. That will come in part from having the wealthy and big corporations pay their fair share. But there are also cost savings, and I'm going to identify some of those today. Uh, together, revenue growth and cost sharing will provide us with new resources to finance our investments. And on the right side of the scale are the people and community priorities. I'll outline some of these investments that will, work, that will give us the biggest bang for our taxpayer buck. And also on the right side is tax relief. I'll show you how we can reduce the tax burden on taxpayers and small businesses. The people's budget includes more than 70 budgetary proposals, some big, 
some small, again detailed in the book that you will receive at the end of today's meeting. We present these proposals as a four-year plan, beginning from fiscal 2014 through fiscal 2017, and we use the mayor's 24, the preliminary budget for 14, fiscal 14 as our baseline. We've identified approximately $15 billion of new resources over the next four years, and that will fund about the same amount in new investments and expenditures. To ensure that this breakfast doesn't turn into lunch, uh, I'm going to briefly walk you through some of our proposals. And again, all of the details will be in the book and on my website. So let's discuss some specifics about revenue growth. We can raise $1.2 billion annually through reforming our income taxes into a progressive income tax, income tax system. I do believe that New Yorkers who make more than $500,000 a year, no offense to the 90% of you here who I'm sure make that amount, can and should contribute more to the city. Mayor Bloomberg has consistently said that New York City is a premium product and worth every penny of it. And I agree. All New Yorkers want to live in a city with safe streets, strong schools, and great parks. My proposal would ask someone earning a million dollars a year or more to pay less than $6,000 in additional taxes. And I do reject the notion that the wealthy New Yorkers will flee the city in droves as a result of a nominal tax increase. But even if all the owners of the penthouses in New York City decided to pack up and leave tomorrow, that doesn't mean that New York doesn't continue to be a magnet for the successful and the wealthy from other parts of the country and the world. Another new revenue source, and here I thank the IBO for their wonderful analysis, would help us pick up an additional $410 million. To get that money, we would toll the East River bridges for non-city residents. It's something that has been talked about before, and I think it certainly makes sense and is more realistic than a restoration of the commuter tax that I would love to see, but I'm not sure how open Albany would be to restoring the commuter tax that more people are talking about nowadays. We should also require insurance companies, like all other companies, to pay the general corporation tax. This would provide another $310 million. Why should insurance companies get special treatment that no one else gets, certainly not our small businesses get. We can also increase commercial real estate tax. I'm sorry, Bill, I think you didn't hear that. We'll leave it at that. Uh, and we can bring in $250 million annually. We can also start asking private equity firms to pay their fair share through the un unincorporated business tax which, uh, for their carried interest, which currently that exemption costs New York City taxpayers $200 million a year. And claw back tax benefits from firms that don't create the jobs they promise. Another at least $33 million a year. Seth, I'm sure you could do more than that. Uh, too many companies are getting subsidies in exchange for jobs that we have seen they have failed to deliver. It's time we stop playing favorites, choosing a few lucky and well-connected firms to bestow huge subsidies on. Instead, Let's use these funds to re reduce the burden on small businesses. We should also eliminate the property tax exemption for Madison Square Garden. That would get us another $16.5 million. And contrary to popular belief, I'm not <laughs> cracking down on Madison Square Garden just because they, they let your army go to Houston. All told, we can come up with more than $2.5 billion annually by asking wealthy individuals and corporations just to pay their fair share. Government needs to do its part too. So let's talk about cost savings. If the Department of Education can get, get its act together, it can collect more than $150 million in increased Medicaid reimbursements. And how about charging rent to schools, to charter schools that use city buildings for free? That's almost another $80 million a year there. We could insource technology contracts, avoiding future scandals like city time, and save nearly $74 million a year. These cost savings, along with others identified in the people's budget, 
will provide us with a total of about $500 million a year in new resources. All told, we've identified here about $3.2 billion annually in additional resources through both cost savings and revenue growth. Now let's discuss some of the people and community priorities. In the first year of this budget, we'll be investing $2.4 billion back into our people and the communities. Our first priority is, and of, of course it is, education. If you look at 10 of the largest cities in America, you'd think that New York would be at the top, or at least near the top, when it came to the percentage of residents with any sort of college degree. But unfortunately, New York is near the bottom, with only 42% of our residents holding college degrees, compared to other major cities like Minneapolis, Boston, and Seattle, which are all above 50%, and with Washington, D.C. in the number one spot at 60%. The People's Budget calls for a new universal preschool, UP3, a full day, year-round early childhood program for each and every one of our city's 100,000 three-year-olds. UP3 would be free of charge to families living in poverty and then available on a sliding fee scale to those who can afford to contribute. In the first year of this program, it will cost about $240 million. There are mountains of research that demonstrate that early childhood education is one of the most important and best investments a society can make. And we need to continue our investments through middle school, particularly in the area of technology, to ensure that all New York City middle schoolers have access to a home computer and broadband internet access. We need to step it up in high school by hiring more guidance counselors to help our kids prepare for college. Research has shown that more than 70% of New York City public school parents do not have a college education. But if we want to break the cycle of poverty affecting many New Yorkers, we do need to help kids navigate the application maze and then get into and graduate from college. We need to recognize the fact that most New York City public school students who go to college go to CUNY schools. So let's do more to help CUNY. One way to do, one way to do this is through what we call a New York City Dream Act, which would provide the equivalent of the federal Pell Grant to undocumented immigrant New York City students who attend CUNY. Another way is to offer free Metro cards to CUNY students who receive financial aid. This is worth a significant amount of money to these CUNY students. And while CUNY tuition is one of the best deals around already, New York City still is one of the most expensive places to live. The people's budget includes more than $100 million of new resources for CUNY students. All told, we're talking about spending more than $700 million a year on new public school education programs so that we can replace the school to prison pipeline and start replacing that with one that goes from cradle to college. Our next priority is public safety. And the first thing that we have to do here is we have to increase the size of our NYPD force back to the levels of the, wh where it was 10 years ago. And to do that, we need to increase the force by 5,000 officers. In the first year, increasing the number of officers would cost us about $80 million. And while we're at it, let's spend the $40 million annually to permanently restore the 20 fire companies that are cut every year by the Bloomberg administration and then restored later on. It's one of the most ridiculous examples of this budget dance. Uh, but also with regard to public safety, I am a firm believer that we need to make changes in the approach that policing takes place in this city. The stop and frisk program is the largest form of racial profiling that is going on in the country today. I believe it makes everybody less safe because the division it has created the amount of distrust it has engendered between communities and the police are making for a situation where communities don't want to talk with the police. The police have a tougher time doing their job, and when that happens, it makes everybody less safe. And that's not to mention the increase in lawsuits that the city taxpayers have had to pay for, something that is now approaching $200 million when it comes to lawsuits and claims against the NYPD. 
I think we can do better and we must do better, and it certainly fits within our budgetary model. Now let's turn to keeping our neighborhoods strong, where our libraries are struggling, homelessness is skyrocketing, and rents are just plain unaffordable. Not surprisingly, demand at our public libraries has been rising over the last decade, and yet the city's contribution to library operating budgets has decreased. The library budget is an annual favorite in the budget dance. The people's budget would provide $35 million to keep every city library open seven days a week with extended hours. It would provide $27 million in housing vouchers for the, home, for the homeless. And the number of homeless families in New York City is, is truly shameful, the, the state that we have gotten to. The amount of taxpayer money spent on sheltering families is right around $457 million a year. We can provide families in crisis with rental vouchers and save millions of dollars in the process. More importantly, we can restore a sense of dignity to their lives. All told, the people's budget would provide nearly $220 million in increased spending on investments that matter to building stronger neighborhoods. Neighborhoods also need capital investments to upgrade the city's infrastructure. The people's budget includes nearly $3.7 billion of capital funds for a strong neighborhoods housing program that would help create, 100, help create or preserve 100,000 units of affordable housing over a four-year period. Uh, we have to create that affordable housing, and we've got a plan to do so Look at the plan, look at the, the document that I'm offering you today. I believe the zoning process in New York City has been deeply flawed. While when areas have been upzoned in recent years, the benefits have often totally accrued to landowners and developers. It's time we make use of inclusionary zoning, better use of inclusionary zoning policies so that the benefits of increased market values are more fairly shared and used to help finance our city's affordable housing needs. The people's budget would reduce city in income taxes for 99% of New York City tax filers. At the same time, small businesses are struggling. It would also eliminate, the people's budget would also eliminate the city's general corporation tax for 240,000 small businesses with annual t city tax bills of less than $5,000. In addition, it would cut the city's unincorporated, unincorporated business tax for 25,000 businesses that make less than $250,000 a year in annual in income. It also would reduce fines for small businesses by $100 million a year. Since small business is the economic backbone of the city, Making the investments in our small businesses will spur economic development and help create plenty of jobs. So I've described for you what we call the people's budget, which includes revenue growth and cost savings, as well as people and community investments and tax relief. Together, these create a balanced budget that over the next four years brings in about $15 billion in new resources and then invests that money in priorities that keep the New York City dream alive and well. The New York City dream has attracted families like yours and mine in this amazing city for generations. It's a dream that has provided great public school education to millions of boys and girls that grew up to be us. It's a dream that can still provide strong neighborhoods, public safety, and progressive workplace policies. I believe and I hope that you will join me in believing that the people's budget can help the, keep the New York City dream alive.